please welcome Vice President, Relational Databases, AWS, Jeff Carter. Welcome. So today what we're going to be talking about is how to move into AWS and some of the great announcements that we have to make during our presentation and some of the, I really wanted to take a sec and thank our development teams for all of the great features that we're going to be discussing today. So let's start with why are we going to modernize? And I don't think anybody in this room is going to be surprised by the thought that companies plan to spend more money on data and analytics over the coming years and they view that as a key investment for helping them grow, understand their customers, and how to grow their business. And Gartner Group is saying it's 40% through 2024. I'm sure many of the people in this room are thinking that probably number, that number is underestimated, and the amount of time will go far beyond 2024. When, we, when I get a chance to talk to customers and we talk about what it means to modernize, I'm hearing a lot of different input, and we're going to spend some time talking about this there is a wide variety of what customers, where they are today and where they want to be. Another thing that we hear a lot from customers is that they want to move from the traditional and historical CapEx model to an OpEx model, and they want to be able to be very flexible in their spend and to try something out and then be able to turn it off. And you can do that with, with, with an OpEx model as opposed to CapEx. We also hear from customers that they're very interested in automation and taking some of the things that they've used people in the past for, and how can AWS help them basically with automation that removes a lot of the heavy lifting in and around data and running databases. And finally, in the new world, where there are so many phones and so many PCs and so many people using our services, the number of transactions that we're looking at has grown immensely, and some of the rules that we've used over the last 30 years no longer work at today's scale. And so people are looking to embrace purpose-built tools that can help them deal with that scale and solve their business problems. Now today, starting with this session, we're going to focus in on Modernize. But this is the first of three sessions that are part of a, a, a grouping. I'm going to talk about Modernize, and then later this afternoon, Raul is going to talk about Unify, which is bringing the data from your transaction processing engines together to be able to do analytics on it. And then after Raul speaks, there will be a session on Innovate, and Broughton will come and talk about using machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to do new forms of analytics on your data to help you with your business value. So today, in this session, it's all about modernize. Now, a moment ago, I talked about, as I talk to customers, people are in a wide variety of states, and I've never seen such a wide variety of states. Whether you're still on a mainframe or whether you are a, a digital native, there is a huge spread of where customers are. And I'm going to break it into four kind of primary categories. The first is I talk to some customers, and they're very happy with their application. But perhaps they need a new data center, or they need to get out of their data center. Perhaps they've got a server that needs a little more oomph or is aging out. And they simply want to move to the cloud in AWS. And they want EC2 because they're perfectly happy with their database, they're perfectly happy with their um, administration, and all they're looking for is a new home to be able to run their equipment. The second type of customer I talk to is like the first, but they say, can you help me with the mundane database administration tasks? And can we use the automation that you put in your relational database service offering to be able to help us reduce the cost and burden of running these databases? The third type of customer that we talk to is what we'll call a break-free customer. And a break-free customer has been very happy with their legacy database that they have maybe have used for the last 10, 20, or 30 years. But frankly, they are tired of paying the licensing fees that are associated with those databases. And they're looking to break free of that licensing fee, and they're wondering if open source can provide a technology that's every bit as good and can help their business continue to grow at a much lower cost. And the final type of customer that I spend time with is one that is really about how can we use the purpose-built tools that AWS has developed to be able to reach new heights in terms of scalability or availability um, with their applications. And we're going to talk about all of these as we go through the presentation. Now, you probably have seen this chart with AWS before. One of the things it's trying to describe to you is the wide variety of different technologies that we can bring to bear. It is the largest portfolio of data-based products in the industry. 
And I'm going to use this chart as kind of an agenda, and we're going to walk around this wheel talking about some of the key announcements that we're making here at reInvent. And we're gonna start the discussion by jumping in and focusing on the relational database service business and Aurora. If you're not familiar with the relational database service, there are seven different products that fit into this category. It is a family, a suite of different database products. So we have two commercial databases with Oracle and SQL Server. We have three open source databases with MySQL, um, uh, MariaDB, and with Postgres. And then we have the Aurora databases, which I will talk about in the next section with MySQL and, um, and Postgres. There are hundreds of thousands of customers today using RDS, and we have millions of instances under management. One of the key announcements we're making today, and we started this announcement last month with um, RDS Custom for Oracle. Today, we are announcing RDS Custom for SQL Server. And what RDS Custom is, is we have been listening to feedback from our customer base. And what they told us was that they were looking for a product that had the management capabilities of the relational database service, the RDS business, but they also wanted some of the flexibility and the administrative privileges they got with the EC2 environment. And so what we have done is combine the best of both worlds with RDS Custom. And so if you have an, an application that expects to run directly on the database instance, that was not possible with RDS. But by giving you root privilege or admin privilege on the underlying EC2 instance, you can now do that with RDS Custom. Another use case is people want to do advanced tuning parameters that were not in scope within RDS. You would now have complete access to all of those tuning parameters. And some applications require very high levels of availability. We were talking with a customer yesterday who their default mode is eight-way active-active. That's application aware. Now, we're not going to support that on the RDS side in our default configuration, and something that's application aware is, needs special handling. But with RDS Custom, we can provide you the base instances, and you can set up your own custom replication schemes, whether they be multi-region, multi-availability zone, a combination of all of the above. And so these are the different types of scenarios that have allowed us to announce both RDS Custom for Oracle and today RDS Custom for SQL Server. Our next customer type is break free. And when we talk to customers about their legacy environments, the things that we typically hear are phrases like, it's expensive, it's proprietary, we're tired of the lock-in, we feel that the licensing poli policies are punitive, and frankly, we're getting tired of being audited and using our resources to do these audits. And so a lot of customers are turning to the open source databases as a way to get around this and to lower their total spend. And Amazon Aurora is a great way to do this. Amazon Aurora gives you the, the Postgres and the MySQL that you're looking for and the industry standard compatibility with those open source databases. But Amazon and AWS have enhanced Aurora with the underlying file system, making it available in three availability zones uh, with six copies of the data. So the availability and durability is excellent, and it gives you the same class of systems that you would see on-premise with these high availability configurations. Now, Aurora has been an incredibly successful business for us. It has continuously been the fastest growing service in AWS history and continues to be so. And we've got two key announcements that, that we're making here. The first is for Babelfish for Aurora Postgres. Now, Babelfish is for SQL Server applications where you continue to run the same application that you've been running against a SQL Server database, but now you're going to take that application and you're going to point it to Postgres Aurora. And we are going to interpret the line protocol over the network that was currently between your application and SQL Server, and we're going to redirect it into Aurora and have Aurora process the database request for you. Now, there are underlying differences between SQL Server and Postgres. And so this will never be a 100% solution. But we've had over 100 customers using this in our beta period and early release period. And the most frequent response that we get is, it just worked. So I encourage you to consider, if you've got SQL Server applications and you're looking to move to something like Aurora, put this in your toolkit, try it, and I think you'll be very surprised by the levels of compatibility that you're going to find. 
if you're using tons of esoteric features within the, the SQL Server database, that's probably where you're going to have, have issues, but for the most part, this is just going to work. The other thing that we did is while we developed this code, we have put it into the open source. And we want the open source community to be able to add and continue to refine this and continue to make Postgres even more compatible with SQL Server applications. The second announcement we're making in the Aurora space is about something called Amazon DevOps Guru for Amazon RDS. DevOps Guru is a machine learning application that can run across your entire AWS footprint. And it uses machine learning and telemetry that we're collecting on, your, on all of the systems to give you advice about what's going on in your environment. What's new here and what we're announcing today is taking it up a level into the database stack for, for Aurora. And so if you have performance insights enabled on your Aurora database, then the data that is being collected is now going to be analyzed through our machine learning algorithms. And we've paired together our machine learning teams with our expert DBAs to try to make sure that we give you information that will be helpful both to your DBA community as well as your DevOps community. And so what we're doing is we're taking the, the uh, performance insights data, we're collecting that, ETLing it, we're running it through SageMaker and our machine learning algorithms, and then we're using that to send the output of anything that we find to the DevOps Guru console, to the RDS console, and we can also do alerting on it if you would like. Now, as we were developing this, we used an internal Amazon team, the one that runs all of our Amazon.com fulfillment centers. And we turned this on their por the Oracle Postgres, or excuse me, their Aurora Postgres instances that they were using. And they have basically one database per fulfillment center. And if you're familiar with the, the concept of an Amazon fulfillment center, think of trucks backing up, unloading stuff all day long, literally millions of items a day, and then things shipping out in boxes and packages that are coming to your homes. And all of that is inventoried in these databases. And when we turned this on, and we used it on these, uh, these internal databases, we found a couple of issues that these expert databases that run these systems had been looking for for months, and we were able to pinpoint. And when we find something, we use the Performance Insights data so we can show you a graph that says, this is the point in time that started, this is what occurred in terms of resource utilization, this is when the problem finished, here were the users that were involved with this abnormality, and here was the exact SQL that they were running and how it affected your system. So this is very specific, detailed feedback that's really tailored to helping your DBAs and DevOps people, and we're super excited about it. The next thing I wanted to talk about was migrations and helping people move from their current environment into AWS and these different technologies. People who have done this know, and it's a fact, that doing the migration planning can be time consuming, it's certainly complex and error prone, it typically involves lots of people, and a lot of times companies don't have those resources, so they bring in consultants. And now you've got consultants who might not know your environment trying to find where your databases are and inventory them. I personally know about this problem. Before joining AWS earlier this year, I spent five years on the, cons the consumer side of the business. And in those five years, one of the things that I personally did was lead the team that moved Amazon.com and its data warehouse and 7,500 transaction processing engines that ran every aspect of the consumer website. We moved all of that out of our legacy environment and our legacy database vendor and into AWS. And I'll g I can tell a long story about what we did and how we did it, but the short version is when we got done and we looked back, our findings were we got better performance in terms of reduced latency, our costs went down significantly, and a lot of it had to do with not paying database licenses anymore, and there was a tremendous amount of reduction in overhead. And it was interesting from a people perspective on the overhead, the DBAs that we had were world class. And they had migrated over time to working Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, doing things like replacing hardware that had failed or patching the operating system or installing new versions of the database. And what they really wanted to be doing was in the office with the business workers helping use data to solve business problems. And by moving to relational, the RDS services in Aurora, the Amazon.com business freed up those DBAs to not be doing those mundane late night tasks um, in the off hours 
and got those people back in the office doing the jobs that they really wanted to be doing. And frankly, that was one of the things that allowed us personally to accelerate the entire program was getting the DBAs really involved and have their help pushing this forward. Today, it's no longer the Amazon.com business that did that. We've got 500,000 plus databases that we have migrated into AWS using the same tooling that we used on the, the .com side. And that's the Database Migration Services, or DMS. And here are just a handful of the types of customers that have been involved in this and moving this. But this is a real business for us, and at 500,000 and increasing scale, we're very serious about building the tools that make this as easy as possible for all of you to be able to do this now and in the future. One of the things that we're announcing today is something called the AWS DMS Fleet Advisor. And a lot of companies, and including the one that I worked with, with in this for our migration, really struggle with doing an inventory of all of their databases. And so the first thing the Fleet Advisor does is we give you software that you install on your network, and it scans your network and helps you find where all of the databases are, irregardless of the technology. And once you've done that, we've kind of got one dimension of a matrix that we're going to present to you, and that is the inventory of all your systems. By the way, I'll tell you, this is useful for a lot of other reasons, but we'll, we'll talk about it in the context of the Fleet Advisor. Second thing it does is you can install more software on the database nodes, and we can collect information about what are the tables, what are the schemas, what is the I.O. rates, um, what, what is the CPU utilization, what types of features are you using inside the database. And with that information, we can present to you um, a matrix that has all of your different systems, and then basically a t-shirt size of what it would take to port that, that database infrastructure into AWS amongst different technologies. So for example, if you had an Oracle database running on-prem, and you said, I would like to move that into an EC2 Oracle instance, that probably would say it's very easy and straightforward. If you said, I wanted to move it to RDS Oracle, it's easy and straightforward. It would say if you want to move it to something like Aurora or to Redshift, it would give you an estimate based on your query patterns of how much effort it would be, again, t-shirt size. And this is the high-level view, and you can then use that to tie into our existing products like Schema Conversion Tool to do the next level of deep dive and really do the planning to help migrate that database into AWS, whether it's the same technology or a different technology. So super excited by this. It takes out a lot of the human work and it really gives you fast results. Now we're gonna pause for a moment and I'm gonna ask Sundar to come out. Sundar is from eHealth and he is here to share with us his, um, his journey into the AWS cloud. So Sundar, please come out and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon all. I'm Sundar, I'm here to talk about eHealth cloud database journey and um, um, so before I talk about uh, our migration, so just want to introduce our company, Yelth. Um, Yelth has been in the uh, industry for over 20 years, and we have served with the Medi uh, Medicare plan and health insurance plan, and uh, we have been serving over 5 million customers. Our mission is to enable a customer find a quality and affordable health plan and health insurance plan. And uh, our uh, overall, we enable our customers to find and, and research a right plan for their needs. And we already served about 5 million customers. We have about 180 top insurance uh, providers on our platform. Um, and we have been growing in double digit number uh, in the last few years. And we also support multiple uh, uh, carrier plans. We support family, a family plan and a small business plan and also a Medicare plan for our seniors. Because of the uh, double digit growth, we have been seeing many challenges in our infrastructure. Um, these are specific to our database side, like the top four that we identified prior to our migration. Uh, majority of the time we spend more on like 30 to 30 percent of the time we spend on maintenance and capacity prior to our migration. So year along, like we'll be spending like two quarters of time figuring out what's our capacity needed to support our pretty much like our, uh, our peak traffic and without focusing on like a business value. So with our migration, we were able to accomplish this. And now we are able to do that without having to worry about spending two quarters of our time on figuring out what capacity that we need to support our business growth. And in prior to our migration, we had different type of database uh, technology in our infrastructure. So with our migration, we were able to consolidate 
into a and standardize our database technology. And this also enabled us to standardize our database skills with our migration. And uh, prior to our migration, we have we have a lack of agility to agility and also operation complexity, and we are not able to innovate in the market space. With our cloud migration, we are able to uh, bring up more modern infrastructure in terms of CI/CD, and we are able to accelerate our deployment faster. And also, we have a growing infrastructure in a traditional, coming from a 20 years of uh, legacy physical infrastructure, we had a continuous cost rise due to the support nature. And with AWS migration, we were able to reduce that, and, and we have plans to reduce like 30 to 40 percent in the next few years. So we migrated to AWS just this year, and prior to that, when we were discussing about the migration, we didn't realize that we were thinking about like it will take like many years. In fact, even up to five years to migrate, but we were able to do that within 11 months. So I don't, if we can do it, I'm sure you all can do it. So how did we do it? So we had a, crafted a three-phase uh, migration strategy. The phase one of our migration strategy is to lift everything into a cloud, and especially in all the databases we are supporting in our environment, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, and into our EC2 infrastructure. And this enabled us to test that in our DR environment, able to really understand our gaps, latency, and other uh, technical challenges prior to our migration. Once we're there and we understand the gaps and we are able to plan on a phase two of our migration in terms of like how we can consolidate all this into a smaller, uh, uh, fewer database types. And we consolidated our Postgres and MySQL to Aurora and uh, MongoDB to our DocumentDB. If you're wondering why we chose these two, these two are already uh, best in class and also it, uh, it comes with uh, uh, decoupled uh, storage and compute and it provides automated recovery and uh, failover, automated backups security, and obviously it's a serverless. Where we're coming from, this is definitely a great going, and it helped us to save a lot of time and energy. Phase three of our migration strategy is to focus on how to build the HA and resiliency. So we were building uh, Aurora Global Data Replication Set and DocumentDB Global Cluster Feature Set. And this enabled us to move all our database and data set into AWS, which enabled us to accelerate our overall migration within 11 months. We had a similar set of uh, uh, three-phase strategy for our backend application stack. We were able to migrate all our backend application into our containers and migrate all of them into a EKS workload. With that, uh, combining with the database, we were able to save at least like, for 1,000 nodes, if not more, and that enabled us to save more in, in terms of cost, migration cost. So prior to, so any migration requires a strategy, right? How are you going to migrate? So what is your strategy? So obviously we also figured out what is based on our end, and we also figured out what should be our uh, key uh, uh, strategy in terms of how we're going to drive this. So we identified these four uh, categories. So we want to continue to support our ongoing development activity on microservice architecture. So we directly enable our engineering team to deploy directly on cloud. So we are able to leverage all the best in class uh, cloud native features for the application. As we are migrating and my, uh, transitioning to the uh, more cloud native database, we are trying to consolidate all these different types of database that we are supporting to a fewer database types, like consolidating MySQL and Postgres. And also we want to make sure that we are preserving as we are consolidating. So basically what we end up doing is like making sure that our uh, MongoDB migration doesn't, like we had a, a JSON workload, so we want to make sure that these are compatible. Uh, DocumentDB is 100% compatible to MongoDB, so we were able to preserve and keep the existing investment as it is. And this is without touching any line of code in our backend. And also like we were able to work with AWS to see how we can deploy um, related technology along with the, the database to accelerate our application deployment to get a better performance. Now that we migrated, so we were kind of wondering what type of impact we got. Did, did we really get what we initially thought our plan was? Yes, absolutely. These are our top four that we identified because of the database migration. After onboarding, in the, in the past we used to take like a couple of days, even weeks, in many weeks, to even provision some database because we are coming from a physical data center world. With, with after migration, we are able to do that in hours, and this is a great win for uh, for the engineering and also for us. We are able to save those resources and spend some of them on a bit more business value initiatives, and this also helped us to auto scale because we migrated. Thus, we don't have to worry about capacity planning and spending two quarters of time like looking at like what would be our 
uh, capacity that we need to meet for their peak traffic. Now with auto scaling, there are, we reduced all the maintenance and downtime. And this also enabled us to save some of the uh, uh, availability and also uh, reduced our downtime. Also, we were able to improve our resiliency by multi-region deployment. We already deployed into three AZs, and we are also going to a cross-regional replication with our database. So this helped us to uh, increase our SLA and reduce our P1 incidents down, which ultimately saved our uh, company a huge amount of like a downtime and production issues. And in, in addition to that, we are also able to eliminate operation toll to 30%, um, where we were able to focus on more spend time on like a, a training our engineering, right? Training our engineering teams and engineers, and also focus on other initiative to see how we can apply some of the industry best practices and and well architecture framework into our uh, our, our maturing our cloud. So what's next? So we migrated within 11 months. We never thought this possible. We were able to do that. Now we are think, trying, looking forward and seeing what we should do next. We are looking forward to consolidate our database technology, and we are trying to see how we can even do a cluster consolidation. Now we deployed many clusters. We are trying to see how we can not only consolidate the database technology, but also consolidate uh, the overall clusters. Now we are trying to see how we can modernize our application stack, so that will help us improve uh, in terms of like maturing our, our cloud further moving forward. And this also help us to accelerate our CI CD to help us to get uh, more benefit for our customers to see the features on a, a day -to -day, daily basis. And third, and we are continuously evaluating a new features, new services that are coming out of AWS to see how we can enable to increase our uh, HA at the same time, reduce cost overall. Our goal is, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to save 30 to 40 percent overall from the next few years. So we are already continuing to work towards that. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me. Nice job. All right, thank you, Sundar. E-Health is a great story, and yet another example of the dot-com business, uh, E-Health of companies that have made the migration uh, with all of their database infrastructure. And to do it in 11 months is nothing short of amazing. Now let's talk about some of the other products in the, the database portfolio. And one of the things that I talked about earlier is that the world is changing, and that some of the applications um, are at a scale that we had not heard of just a few years ago. There are 1.3 billion PCs in the world. There are 6.3 billion phones in the world. Um, I'll give you a couple examples from my life on the dot-com side. Um, our clickstream is on the order of two trillion records a month. Um, our use of DynamoDB on a day like Cyber Monday that happened earlier this week. I have not heard the final number, but I know it will be on the order of 100 million transactions per second in DynamoDB. These are levels of scalability that your, your teams may be operating at that are typically unheard of just, just a decade ago. And they require us to change the technology because some of the technology that we've used in the past is just not capable of running at these levels. And so when we take a look at what's going on in the AWS portfolio, let's talk about some of the products that help in this space and some of the things that we are adding here today and announcing. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is Amazon DynamoDB. Now, DynamoDB is a fast and flexible NoSQL database. It is a key value store and a document database. And it scales incredibly. And so let me give you an example with Zoom. When the pandemic started, Zoom was a very successful business doing approximately 10 million phone calls a day. And as the pandemic hit, they expanded rapidly to 300 million phone calls a day. How did they do that? Well, I'll give a tremendous amount of the credit to the Zoom team. They did fantastic things. But one of the underlying technologies they used to help achieve that was DynamoDB. What we're announcing today with DynamoDB is a new class of storage table. And it's called the infrequently accessed storage table. Now, let me set up with a little bit of a scenario. And I'm going to use the dot-com business, the Amazon.com business, as my example. Um, think of the order history. One of the tables that Amazon keeps is every purchase that has ever been made on the website since it was opened in 1994. And you can think about the data that what you're buying today, that data is relatively hot, and it needs the performance of DynamoDB and the high ops and the scalability. 
But when we store that entire table, some of the data is older. And so if you bought a book on the very first day of Amazon.com opening, that's still in your order history. And you can search for that, you can find that, and we want that to have great latency. And you would be able to access it and buy another copy or send a copy to a friend. What the infrequently accessed table is for these very large tables where you still need that great access to the hot data and the more recent data. But when you look at the overall spend, you've got a tremendous amount of data that you want to have access to and have fast access to, but the amount of IOPS on it is nowhere near what you have in the most recent data. And so the infrequently accessed table is something where you simply go to the RDS console for DynamoDB, you click on a new uh, button that is there for infrequently accessed, and in the background, we are going to go relay out your data within your Dynamo table at a reduced cost to us, and we're going to pass that reduced cost on to you with up to a 60% reduction in storage costs for that cold data. You will still get the great performance and what you expect on the more recent data, and the older data will be there and the latency will be great, but the expectation is the amount of IOPS operating on it will be significantly less. And so this is, this is our announcement for Dynamo today. Now our next announcement is related. That's a form of tiered storage. And we're doing the same thing with ElastiCache. Now ElastiCache is a very high performance in-memory solution for big scale. And so for web apps or phone apps where you really want to have some data that's immediately available and you want it in memory, and this can be very large data sets, this is a solution for you. You know, an example of this is Peloton. If you were to have a Peloton bike and you look at their leaderboard and what their dashboard is, that leaderboard is being stored in ElastiCache and being served up to you in real time as, as you are racing on the, on the bike. What we're announcing with ElastiCache is data tiering. Now here the data tiering, before with Dynamo, we were doing SSD formatted one way to SSD formatted a different way. With ElastiCache, what we're doing is in memory now plus local NVMe storage. The NVMe storage is very fast, but not quite as fast as memory. And we're going to use the memory as a least recently used cache in front of the, the new NVMe. But if you were to choose with ElastiCache a node like the R6GD, which is a Graviton-based node, and the D says that it has local disk, we're going to allow you to do this data tiering on ElastiCache. Now, why would you do that? You're going to give up a tiny bit of performance, but it's going to quadruple the amount of memory that you have available and the storage that you have available on each of the ElastiCache nodes. And so if you need to have a petabyte size ElastiCache cluster, this will give you the reach to be able to do that. Or if you want to reduce your cost by having one-fourth the number of servers, you can take that approach as well. And there are no code changes required. Now, let's jump into the next section and talk about some of our other databases on the wheel. And the next thing that we want to touch on is Amazon TimeStream. And TimeStream is our database for time series data. It's fast, it's scalable, it's serverless, and it's pay per use. In the use cases for time stream, typically evolve, and there are many, but here are a few. One is clickstream, and I talked about the, the consumer website doing two trillion rows per month. Um, another would be IoT applications, monitoring and maintenance. Maybe you've got real time fleet analytics for a fleet of trucks or you're looking at air conditioners and IoT sensors coming off the air conditioners for controlling your, your buildings and, and the temperature within your buildings. Banks and financial applications for, are doing transactional analysis through time sequence. And many companies, and probably many of you here in this room, if you're doing DevOps analysis, your teams are looking at what's going on inside your applications, what's going on inside your servers, and other aspects of your environment. All of these are great examples of very high output, very high speed IoT type sensors that are perfect for a time series database. Now, what are we announcing? We're announcing something that we're calling scheduled queries. Now, because the data sets for these IoT, coming off these IoT sensors can be very large, perhaps trillions of rows, performance of queries against that data set sometimes takes a, a while. And so what we're announcing today is a way of aggregating the data coming out of those sensors. And this is effectively a form of a materialized view for the database folks 
that gives you the ability to aggregate this data and be able to get much better performance in terms of enabling dash, real-time dashboards, getting real-time business reports, and many other applications. Because you're aggregating the data, the data set size can be orders of magnitude smaller, which leads to orders of magnitude improvement in query performance. The other thing with this is you can output to the output of the materialized view to um, IoT Core, S3, Kinesis. Um, you can then use tooling within AWS like QuickSight or Grafana or SageMaker to be able to do your analytics. And you can use CloudWatch monitoring for all of your metrics. An added advantage of this approach is for privacy. Many times we worry about privacy and being able to see individual records or individual companies, and many times aggregation could be an approach to de-anonymize the or to anonymize the data and de-identify. De sorry, I'm De-identificate the data, and uh, this is an approach that you can use for that as well. At the end of the day, scheduled queries is all about making these large data sets and your queries run much faster and more performant at less cost. So with that, we've kind of walked the wheel and talked about our major announcements, and now we're gonna have some fun. So I'm gonna ask Rob Ford to come out. Rob is from HBO Max. Let me tell you why you're here. You've come because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your whole life. Felt that something is wrong with the world. You don't know what, but it's there like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Hi, my name is Rob Ford, and I'm responsible for database, uh, database reliability engineering at HBO Max. Follow me on a journey where we explore the possibilities of purpose-built databases. This is the world you know, the world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It is a time of monolithic traditional databases. You are heavily reliant on manual processes which constrain your ability to experiment with new technologies. Your tightly coupled architectures make it extremely difficult to change. And finally, in a time of tight, tight labor markets, you find it increasingly difficult to staff for skills in the dark arts of database optimization. And yet, you've had dreams that aren't just dreams. Perhaps they were kids at startups using technologies that you've only just heard of. Or perhaps it's of this frictionless managed services environment in which oper operational toll disappears, leaving you free to work on business features. So what if there's another way? You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering you is the truth, nothing more. So you may have heard of HBO Max. Let me tell you a little bit about something of the challenges that we have to deal with. Success in the streaming industry requires a growth rate which is absolutely pressing at times, and it's enabled only through significant enhancement of new features as well as widespread, widespread growth of our footprint. The challenge of scaling to grow to hundreds of millions of subscribers is difficult enough as it is, but then you add to that bursty traffic that other services don't always have to deal with. So for example, when you have the best content, you don't limp in in the middle of the night with it. So we drop that in prime time. Episodic content releases, movies, sports, all of that adds a degree of concurrency that you don't always see elsewhere. We have, uh, all of this has to happen, of course, in, the, uh, in an environment where TV can absolutely never go down, and it can't cost an arm and a leg either. So how do we succeed when it comes to database modernization? For starters, the loose coupling that comes with, the data, uh, with a microservices architecture is critical to achieving the flexibility needed to expand your, uh, expand your architecture. Uh, we believe in the, the discipline of database reliability engineering with its focus on heavy investments in automation and that combined with key table stakes operability features of the databases that we choose give us the operational ability to take on more and more. We are, uh, we, we believe a lot in architectural governance and having processes that allow you to make intelligent choices, make sure that your innovation choices don't outstrip your operational budget. Of course, we always choose for elastic scale and global replication features due to the nature of our service. 
And finally, we employ cost engineering processes to make sure that our incremental costs are in line with the needs of the business. So let's take a few uh, minutes to look at some examples of uh, our use of purpose-built databases. So for starters, uh, let's take a look at the purchases database and the purchases, purchases service where we use Amazon RDS for PostgreSQL. So the purchases database is where we capture our direct consumer purchasing information, and this is our crown jewel, most strategic customer relationship. And in a handful of tables, we capture financial data. And as such, the engineering team had, re had requirements for relational integrity as well as transactional support. And this data is accessed by the application in a number of different ways, which made indexing support critical. So the native features of Postgres were a perfect fit for this use case. But added on top of that, uh, RDS brings the ability to do global replication, which is really critical as well for our, for our service. Um, we add PG Bouncer for additional scaling capabilities. And additionally, we uh, use a DMS in order to achieve uh, advanced things such as zero downtime upgrades, again, because of our reliability requirements. And so, of course, the fully managed solution for us is really attractive. So it may be a little bit conventional as use cases go, but when I see the skills that the team exercises on a daily basis and the, their proficiency with operating and automating this platform day in, day out, I feel like I'm watching more of a martial arts display. Next up, let's talk about the devices service, where we employ Elastic, Amazon Elastic Cache. So the devices service is where we capture the status of devices, sign, de capture and manage the status of devices signed in on our network, in our network. So we store this data in Cassandra currently. And one of the challenges with this is that device updates can come in both asynchronously through an SQS queue, as well as synchronously through HTTP, which makes the problem of event sequencing really challenging. And of course, if we don't get this right, we will deliver a flaky experience to our customers. And of course, that's not what we want. And so what we've chosen to do, rather than the traditional approach of doing conditional writes to Cassandra, which would, which would inflict a lot of load on the database, as well as a lot of resource intensity to those operations, instead, the use of an in-memory cache in front of the database gives the application engineers a really efficient way of doing the needed deduplication checks as well as uh, out-of-sequence messaging discards needed to maintain data integrity. So uh, this, is a, this is a case where uh, ElastiCache Redis fit the bill perfectly. And of course, this is not free. The engineering team did have to do a little bit of work. But with a little bit of effort, we were absolutely able to dodge a number of bullets. Next up, let's talk a little bit about um, the pickup service. So uh, this is a place where we use Dynamo Database. So pickup is a feature you're probably familiar with. And it's where um, you, know, you watch episode of content. And it records the last watched episode. So of course, you don't have to go and scroll through a list to go and resume playback the next time you want to sit down and watch your, your favorite series. So it's a use case which is, of course, important to our customer base. But it's not critical to the business the same way that, for example, financial data is. It's a very simple data model, and the data is accessed in very sim simple ways. And so given that, a key value store made perfect sense for this use case. Um, with that, we also have a multi-region data replication requirement, like everything else in HBO Max. But one thing that was really attractive about Dynamo in this case was the active-active replication mode, which made the architecture really, really simple. It made the code very simple. And if you look at the diagram, it's a very simple-looking flow. Um, and of course, we love the managed service aspect of this database. And so, of course, when the needs of the, uh, when the, needs of the application line up this well with the database platform, you don't need to dodge bullets. So finally, let's look a little bit towards the future. Let's talk a little bit, a bit about Aurora. And we look to this as sort of our next step in scaling the application even further globally around the planet. So of course, when we expand the footprint, you add an awful lot more global replicas. And Aurora is purpose-built from the ground up to handle a large number of replicas. More customers mean more rights, and of course, down over a bigger distance. And so Aurora's native support, again, for a reduced replication lag, means that our subscribers will, endure, in, will enjoy a much more um, consistent experience throughout the globe. More customers means more blast radius when things go south. And so Aurora's improved RTO and RPO are really attractive in, in terms of maintaining the reliable experience that people have come to expect. And finally, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that testing gets very difficult as you get to a globalized service. And I'm personally very excited about the possibilities of database cloning 
to give us new flexibility and new realism in our test environments. So 2021 was a good year for HBO Max. In the span of just literally a few months, we went from operating in one country to operating in several dozen. And a large, in a large part, I think a lot of this is attributable to a lot of the capabilities that come with Amazon databases. And we've been very successful with them, and we look for this momentum to continue into the next year. So time to fly. And finally, these are technology talks, but really it's about people. And this is the team of employees that make this all a reality. Uh, so I do the talking, but they do all the work and they make it, they make it real. Um, and if you can't tell, I've ripped off the plot of an entire movie for my talk, so thank you so much for bearing with me. Thank you so much. Nice job. All right, thank you, Rob. I hope all of you enjoyed that. Uh, in one of our early planning sessions, we had the idea with this movie coming out that we might be able to tie this together, and Rob really took the bait and ran with it, and I think he did a fantastic job. So thank you very much, Rob. All right, we're gonna wrap up here, and let's talk about continuing your data journey here at AWS and reInvent. And so what we wanna do is talk about what we just finished is modernizing your infrastructure. And we have two more sessions later today on Unify and Innovate. And so I'd encourage you to come out and bring your friends. Uh, at 2.30 p.m., I believe here in this theater, we've got Raul, and he will be talking about uh, you know, reinventing your business with data and analytics. And then we'll have Bratan Saha coming out, and he will be talking about machine learning and how you can use machine learning on all of the data that we're collecting in the systems that we've got with Modernize. So with that, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for, to our development teams. Thank you for all of you being here. And special thanks to both Sundar and Rob. <laughs>